So please welcome John Latta to the show. Welcome, John. Thank you, Ashley. Appreciate the invitation. Really happy to be here. Oh, me too. And it was so fun getting to know you and preparing for this time and learning that you're from my home state in <laughs> Redmond, Washington. I have you know, family still there and a lot of dear friends. And, you know, I, I moved to San Diego to get a, to, I went to Washington state university actually for mm-hmm. two years, right out of high school. And I mean, those cow fields and the snow, I just couldn't do that. And so <laughs> <laughs> came to San Diego for a spring break and with my mom and thought there's blue sky and a beach. Like, what are you, doing? what am I missing? <laughs> so I finished college out here and yeah, went back from this, this time to a couple of times lived in Montana. So it's not that I have been here since, but yeah. anyway, so fun to meet you. And, you know, I look back at what I've learned about your life and you're what 63. Correct. Uh, I'm 53. So there's just a 10 year difference, but mm-hmm. you know, I, I look back at when I look back at life now at this age and you just always are putting the dots together and you know, that Steve jobs quote, you know, that what, I don't even know the, jo- you know, the putting, yeah, you know, it, <laughs> everything makes sense looking backwards, basically. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> With time. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and I look at my life that way, but it, you made me look at my life more like that since I've been l- listening to you and reading your website. And, um, and then, so then I go back to the, where I want to start with this interview, okay. I could start 20 years from now or 20 years ago when you kind of had your like awakening kind of, right. but you know, and I always say magic moments, cause this is uncovering your uncover your magic. And I always say like, when did you uncover your magic? I don't believe you've kind of changed that question for me. We're always uncovering our magic. We just right. might not know we are. <clears throat> and so I want to take you all the way back to your, when you were living at home, with as a little, I mean, I, there's a story about you when you were four years, when four months old and your mom got in a car accident and you were Correct. taken away. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, so I grew up in Southern California, just the reverse of you. And my, um, my parents originally were from up here. And so they got married, um, and escaped to sunnier, <laughs> sunnier weather. Uh, and we lived in Long Beach and, um, Actually, I take that back. So when I was four months old, they first moved to Stockton, California, which at the time was all farming and, you know, it's, it's changed a lot in 50 years. And so I'm four months old and my mother is in a, just a brutal car crash with a friend in a sports car. And she ends up being in the hospital for almost six months. And um, it didn't look like she was going to live. And so my poor dad, he's got a four month old drives all the way up to Seattle. And I lived with various relatives until I was about one and was reunited with my mother. And my mother swears to this day that I didn't even recognize her after that. So, you know, it's not something I remember consciously, but no doubt on some level, it was very formative. Right. And then you, you know, you were, I don't think your parents were very spiritual. You were raised kind of Catholic, right? Yeah. Part-time Catholic. My mother, part-time Catholic, my dad, not so much. So raised kind of on a, you weren't going to church, you weren't believing like in a higher yeah. power. Well, we went for uh, what would be normal for us would be to go every Sunday for six months and then just forget for a year <laughs> oh, okay. Christmas. So part-time, um, but I did go to church. And um, so a very formative experience occurred to me when I was about 13. And cause we did go to church on this Sunday and in the Catholic tradition, a woman is supposed to cover her head before she goes into church. Otherwise, it's considered a sin. And this day, mom was walking in without her head covered. I said, mom, you forgot to cover your head. That's a sin. Oh, no, the church decided it's not a sin anymore. And it just floored me. I they, Literally, my naive mind was sort of like, oh, I thought God wrote the Bible. You mean men wrote the Bible? And hmm. the rules can be changed? And the interpretations are very individual? And so for some reason, from about that day forward, I was very sort of, I, I avoided and was kind of antagonistic towards uh, any religion and any spiritual practice. Yeah. yeah and that then, went on for 30 more years. <laughs> but the, so another fascinating thing that I related to, because I, when I was in my late teens, I was probably in high school starting to be like interested in, you know, reading spiritual books, you know, the self-help section at the bookstore, um, you know, buying certain, you know, 
I don't know, quotes and, you know, let's really draw into that. And what I know about you is that at that stage, were you reading Think and Grow Rich and the Magic of Thinking Big? That's so you're still there, right? Yeah, I I was reading those books. Uh, There was uh, The Magic of Thinking Big, Think and Grow Rich, Psycho Cybernetics. And uh, so I was probably, I'm guessing around 17, 18 when I read those books, but I didn't consider them spiritual. I just remember like what landed for me was I don't have to limit myself. Like I, I didn't limit myself going forward. Like if I went for something, I thought, well, let's try and do it in a big way. You know, it's just as much work as doing it in a little way. And so um, that was approach I took to life and probably still do today. There's, I don't, what I got from that books is I realize our limitations are mostly not completely, but mostly self-imposed. Right. Yeah, for sure. I live that yeah. way too. And that's yeah. why I relate to you there. I, yeah. I've always been, you go big or go home. I, I just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I just, why not? I always yeah. was the person, like, if we we're going to go look at houses, for an example, I would never go, I would always go like the highest price point that would be the farthest, farthest from the reach that we could possibly <laughs> dream of. And, yeah. and then now my husband now, like I did that before I met him, but he's more <laughs> of the real, you know, like Ashley, you know, and I said, no, you just never know. You got to yeah. go big. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. You know? So, and those books too, you know, I read those early on in my life, not the magic of thinking big, but think and grow rich and uh, the Florence Shin books. Did you read hers? I don't think so. No, uh, the game of life and how to play it. Your word is your one. Oh, I just, I used to give those books to all of my friends, <laughs> but you know, I just, I think starting there and then when you start to, you know, I mean, you're such a smart businessman, you know, starting there and then going entrepreneur all in, get married, have children. So now we're going to this part. Now we're kind of going back to, I want to start fast forward after you, you know, you go to college and all that, but now you're meeting a woman, you're getting married, that kind of thing, getting your job. Yeah. So, um, I am a college dropout, uh, not because I wasn't intelligent, but school just wasn't for me. And I was working for QFC, which was a large regional grocery chain at the time. And, you know, I was kind of one of these competitive, high energy. I had a really strong sense of how to bring order out of chaos. And so I fit managing and retail really well. And uh, they kept asking me, do you want to go into management? No, I'm going to school. Do you want to go to management? Oh, no, I'm going to school. And then a friend of mine dropped out of school who was hyper intelligent. One of those kids who was always years ahead of everybody else and went into management. And it just never really occurred to me that I could do it too. And so I screw it. I'm dropping out of school. I never really liked it anyway. For I, I love to learn. I've been reading books voraciously since I could read. Um, but school always went either too fast or too slow for me too fast. If I wasn't interested too slow, if I was really right. interested. And so, um, I quit my, uh, I dropped out my third year of college and went into management and the chain was QFC. They're now owned by Kroger. They're one of the Kroger family of chains. Yeah. I grew up going to QFC. Oh, okay. Well, you know, and so, you know, I set my sights big and I wanted to be the youngest store manager ever. And I was, I got to be, you know, when I got promoted to store manager, I was the youngest store manager in the history of the company. Hmm. And QFC was great because they were highly, I will use the word systematized. And so I learned how to bring that structure and order into my life. And then later I decided to start my own company when QFC got sold to Fred Meyer and then Fred Meyer got sold to Kroger and it just wasn't a fun place to work anymore suddenly everything's being run out of Cincinnati and the customers are complaining. And I'd always had an entrepreneurial mindset, even when I was young. And even while I worked at QFC, I was always doing things on the side. And I I became enamored with this, you know, biodegradable, non-toxic product that could remove stains and odors. And it was kind of ahead of its time. And I I found a way to essentially copy it and recreate it uh, in a different way. And at the time I had little kids and you know what it's like when you have I, you know, I, I would imagine a lot of families, they get, you know, they have their first child or two, and they probably get their first dog or cat at the same time. Right. And suddenly you've got messes around the house you never used to have when you were single. Right. And, um, and so it was a biodegradable, non-toxic uh, product, um, environmentally friendly that I called kids and pets stain and odor remover. And um, 
And I started selling it in three QFC stores and people liked it. And they were saying nice things about it. And I was like, gosh, I could probably start a business for this. So um, I left QFC, I left my super secure, safe job and plunged into the world of being a big chemical company. <laughs> That's the great thing about the magic of thinking big is that sometimes you don't overthink things, you plunge in, and but sometimes you get in over your head too. So right. I thought I knew more than I did. And uh, I promptly dug myself into debt to the tune of $650,000. And so I borrowed against the house, 250,000 credit card debt, uh, 100,000 SBA loan. I borrowed money for anybody and anything that I could. And every day it looked like I was going to go bankrupt. I tried mm -hmm. to grow <laughs> too big, too fast. I learned some lessons about cash flow. I learned about growing too fast. And um, so that's really, that was the next big transition in my life. You, you know, when you told that story and I was listening yeah. to it, it was like, oh, if Shark Tank was on at that stage of your life, yeah. he would be like the first one. They would want your product. Yeah. Yeah. They would no, take I, you to 650. <laughs> I didn't even know about Shark Tank back then. I'm not even sure if it was around. And, no, I don't and, think it was. I'm saying yeah. if it was, you would yeah. be the perfect candidate for that show. Yeah, you're exactly right. I did see it, you know, more recently. And uh, yeah, I thought about that. But um, so and that began, um, Ashley. Um, Interestingly, the most exciting and the most horrifying time of my life. And so uh, at first I was so happy leaving, but then I was so petrified by how much I dug myself into debt. And at that same time, my wife, who was in her 30s, healthy, drank very little, didn't smoke, didn't do drugs, exercise, ate well, she gets cancer. And, um, and it was thyroid cancer. She had a lump on her thyroid. You, know, you could see it in her throat. And the doctors were so concerned um, that I think it was just two weeks after I was diagnosed, they removed her entire thyroid gland, a bunch of lymph nodes, and she had to take a pill every day for the rest of her life just to live. And it changed her. And I didn't know how to support her at that age and stage in my life. And she went very inward, was reading books about God, the meaning of life, death. And I think she was really reconsidering her entire life. Who am I? How am I living my life? Am I happy? Is this what I want? You know, and so she really confronted her own death, her own mortality. And in the middle of it all, she decides she wants a whole new life. And she says, you take the kids, you're the better parent. <laughs> and she moves out and moves on. So now I'm a single dad with two kids, nine and 11, and a company that's hanging by a thread, unbelievable fear. And then to top it all off, John, the, the anti-religious, anti-spiritual guy, is suddenly terrified of death and I don't know where it's coming from. And, and suddenly I never confronted my own mortality and I never, they, you know, I kind of associated death with the body. And if I die and the body dies, then it's it, that's it. It's all over. And I couldn't get oblivion or forever out of my mind. And it was terrifying to me. So in a short period of time, I went from being, you know, a great dad, a great manager, a company that loved me to bad dad, bad husband, bad businessman, and a man running around behind closed doors in, in fear of death and not knowing who to talk to about it because I didn't have that religious and spiritual upbringing. Right. When, you, you know, as a mother, I have two daughters, yeah. 13 and 16. I know at the time <clears throat> they were nine and 11, but I, when I went back to that part of the story as a mom. I mean, your wife, I, so I look at life from a higher perspective, like yeah. wow, she came in, I look at it like you chose each other yep. to learn these lessons, you know, for her as a mother to say, okay, John, you're the better dad. I, this thyroid cancer woke me up. I need to, I'm on, I'm going down this other, I always say the yellow brick road. Yeah. I'm going to take this other path. Right. Yeah. But you know, that's a, that's a courage beyond <laughs> that's some, some, a drive that she felt. But yeah. it's for your, it's for both of your growths. You know, yeah. it's like this higher view of like where it's taking you on this journey and this body. Yeah. And it was so fascinating because that's a big step. That's a yeah. big, as a mom to say, like, you know, here you go. Gotta go. Oh, right? I, you know, and here's the crazy thing, Ashley, um, not too long, maybe six months after that happened, I signed up for my first ever spiritual retreat. And that was a big leap for me. That was like the Nazi skinhead moving in with the black family across the street. It was that right. difficult for me. And, um, and instead of having a lot of crazy wonder spiritual experiences, 
uh, I mean, I did, but not in the way I expected. It was like uh, compassion was just in my face the whole time I was there, right down to the point where the guy who's my roommate in these little cabins out in the mountains is saying, oh, John, I guarantee your wife is in pain. Like she is in such pain, you know? And I, I, I was kind of, you know, like, oh, I'm going to be a great parent. You know, I'm going to be mom and dad. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through this. And I, I hadn't really thought about it. And, and then strangely, um, I get paired up with a woman and we're doing some exercises. She's like my partner for the most of the time I'm there. And she's planning on leaving her husband and kids when she gets home from the retreat. Oh my and gosh. So, I know. And so I, 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 was, I was confronted with all this judgment, but by the time I ended the retreat, it was my first glimpse of what I would call true compassion. Probably my first glimpse of seeing something the way you describe it from that higher perspective. And, um, and it was fine. You know, I, it was, I mean, I still struggled when I came home, my, you know, still had kids, uh, still honestly grieved that they didn't have their mother with them all the time. And, um, you know, still trying to figure out how to get my company in the black, but, uh, I, I let my ex-wife off the hook after that. And, you know, I'm really glad I did because we get along great now and, and, huh. and did continuously never never turned any big, ugly confrontations or arguments. And um, oh, I love that. That gives me tears, kind of. <laughs> well, and it was really beautiful, but not in the oh. way I expected. Right. Yeah. You know, but to look at it, even before you, you know, understand what judgment and compassion and love, you know, really is at that stage of your life, you know, like, and, but just going to that retreat, I mean, there's <laughs> as the man, like I look at you in that life, up until that point, like masculine, yeah. you know, assertive, you know, businessman, I've got to figure this out. I'm going to yeah. do what it takes to make this successful, yeah. you know, like, but to go, I'm going to go to a, a spiritual retreat, <laughs> you know, like that just doesn't, you know, it, it just is amazing that you even listened to that intuition and went, I mean, and went lovingly and with an intention to figure out, start figuring out your life. Yeah. And, and again, like we had talked about at the very beginning, it isn't until some time goes by, you can look backwards. Everything in my life was a journey from masculine to feminine. I mean, I go, I, I, I realized I had the opportunity to be both mother and father, both to my kids. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, it took a while, but I really embraced that. I ended up in group therapy <laughs> and in a blink of an eye, most of the time I was the only guy with 10 women and two women therapists. And it was almost like, we're going to teach you a different way of being, John. Uh, I go to the spiritual retreat. I say connected with them afterwards. And, you know, even the teacher himself would say, you know, just go with it. You're not going to lose your highly developed masculine. And you'll, you'll have, you'll be more resourceful in the end. And so everything in my life became about embracing everything that most people would associate with feminine. And, um, and so I had no idea what a one-sided life I'd been living. Huh. And so it was, again, difficult, scary, oh, the vulnerability, I hated it. Um, but I'm so glad I went through it now. Right. You know, well, I look at, you know, I mean, if I was just gonna look at my husband, cause yeah. I was relating, <clears throat> trying to listen to you talk and how, you know, I look at um, my life. Like I lived, I was single until I was 35. You know, I didn't, I had to run my life and I was running it in a masculine way. Yeah. So to turn a feminine on from a masculine woman, you know, running life, having to, you know, making sure everything's done. I never had that masculine man to interject, to help allow the feminine to come out. You right. Know? So when I'm listening to you in, in an opposite way, you know, like this man that, you know, going from, I feel, I feel like a man, masculine man, like you are turning into this, you know, he's on this. I feel like you're now you're down this other yellow brick road, yeah. the spiritual path. You're like, you're trying to figure out your, like, what am I, how am I, what, what am I going to do? Like, how do I get my mind, my life centered or focused or my purpose, or, you know, I have these children and this business, but you're, you're looking outward now instead of yeah. trying to fix something. Cause I always feel the masculine is trying to fix it, Yeah, but you're not trying to fix it. You're not going to home Depot and trying to find, you know, you're like out, you're really going outward. And it's so, it's so inspiring to men that listen to this show to you. You are 
still masculine, (laughs) you know, but it's like, gosh, he figured out a way to turn that street and go down this road and it discover this beautiful, I mean, wait till you guys hear the rest of this story, but you know, like, you know, going down this as a man has always led his life as a man, all the, you know, for 30 plus years and to then be confronted with this, like, you know, wife leaving, uh, fear of death. Like that whole thing is like crazy, you know, but you know, but that came, but in my mind, the fear of death is like, okay, John, wake up, start figuring (laughs) out that we're not dying or there's no death. Yeah. Let me give you the biggest question in this life to really ponder because there is no death and you better start that journey now. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Um, Ironically, in that same retreat I went to um, in 2002, it was three years later that he formed a year round study group and I joined 40 other people, signed up for the whole year and um, we met four times a year at a retreat center in Tucson, Arizona. Everything else we did like online or at home on our own, you know, we had weekly practices and things to do and study, but I'll never forget it. The month of November comes and he says, this is the month of November and we're going to greet the mystery of death. And he goes, I want you to prepare for your death. If you don't have a will, make a will. If you need need to make amends to other people, make amends. I want you to meditate on death, pray on death, read books on death, listen to music on death embrace the mystery of death. And oh my God, Ashley, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because it was the thing that even at, even for those last few years, there was always lurking in the background, this fear of death. Um, but I, I admit, I, the um, saving my business and being mom and dad to my kids took priority, I guess, space-wise, energy-wise. And um, and I'll never forget it. Profound dreams came through. Profound visions came through. It's sort of like, you know, people have described guides speaking to them or angels speaking to them. It was like, okay, yay, John, we're going to teach you all about death. But first, we're going to teach you all about life. And I mean, it was literally that almost like a course. And in that, at the end of the month, all fear of death was gone. I may have other things that trip me up nowadays, but death is not one of them. And and it sounds so cliche to face your fears and embrace your fears. But boy, I tell people to do that all the time. Okay. Take a step towards the thing you're most terrified of. And when you now, what would be your perspective? Like when you look at John before this um, profound awakening of what yeah. death is, what is, what does that John say? What, what is the, the opposites? What are the, what's the polar polarity of the two? Uh, Well, if I'm understanding your question, are you asking how I perceive death now? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so I'll share (laughs) um, the two most profound things that happened to me. The first one was I, I meditated on death and and sometimes not always, if I went into meditation with a sincere, clear question an answer would come. And so I went in very sincerely and asking, and The first thing I literally, there was a voice that said, well, John, before you know about death, first you need to know about life. And I get taken to this beautiful, like Spanish style home, looks like Southern California. And I walk inside and it's got skylights and there's this beautiful blue light coming down. You know, it's just very beautiful. And and I see this vision of, um, it looks like Siamese twins. And one of them looks like Hercules. He's big, sinew, brawny struggle you know muscle sweat and uh and but he's fused uh to jesus and jesus Mm. is perfectly erect like a pole and very tall standing tall and sort of resolute and i see hercules struggling and struggling and then he suddenly looks over his shoulder behind him and he recognizes that jesus is his brother and they turn around as siamese twins and embrace and that was the first experience And so what I, and so that was first, John, we want you to know about life. And so the way I understood that, and again, this was early days of my journey, Jesus would, I would say, represent the divine aspect of myself. Hercules might be my body, my ego, the human being, let's say. Right. And um, so that was the first beginning is, you know, we want you to understand this about life. You are both divine and you're having this human experience. And the second dream it was like, okay, we're going to teach you all about death now. <laughs> this one was kind of wild. I, in the vision, I'm out 
in a farmer's field, it feels like October and the field's been harvested and it's cold and there's a beautiful harvest moon low on the horizon. But between me and the moon is this big um, scarecrow. You know, he's 10 feet off the ground and he looks 10 feet tall and he's very terrifying and imposing, almost daring me to move forward. And, but I did, I moved past him. And as soon as I moved past him, I fuse with the moon, the moon and I fuse. And I turn into this river of liquid mercury. You know, mercury's got that kind of weird quality. Right. And uh -huh. so it, it's traveling across the top of the earth. And as if the earth were flat, it drips off the edge of the earth, disappears into infinite black space. And then I sat there for what felt like a very long time. And then poof, I'm transformed into, if you've ever seen images of um, geometric grids of light that surround the planet, Right. I was a part of those geometric grids of light and, um, and these, and, but the grids of light were composed of people. It looked like millions of skydivers linked and holding each other by the wrists and the ankles. Huh, uh -huh. And so I was part of that grid and it's hard to put into words. I was both, I was both individual and I was collective. I was, I could still have a sense of me, John, but I was also part of this greater uh, collective and Literally, I could feel the questions and prayers from people down on earth. And so, again, my understanding of this, you know, trying to, it's so hard to conceptualize these things, is that after I die, I join this collective, and it might be called collective wisdom, let's say. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm, I would be in service, I just wouldn't be in a body anymore. And so mm -hmm. that's my understanding of death, and nothing that's happened since then has shaken that that fundamental belief that when we die, there's both an individual me, but there's also a collective we that we become a part of. Right. But in any case, there ain't no end. There ain't <laughs> it's no just end. the end of the body. <laughs> right. And yeah. do you see God as an all one as we're all God? How do you define God? Um, yeah, I don't, I, I, you know, I've had some strange experiences that lead me to believe that behind everything is God. <laughs> like right. I, you've probably heard, it sounds cliche, it's all just God's play. And we all feel like we're individuals and we are, but we're also part of God's play. And so how do I see God uh, all? God is everything and nothing. He's, he's the witness. He's He's the creator. He's the destroyer. It's all of the above. And I, I don't even know if words are adequate to describe uh, God is everything. God is nothing. You know, he's form and he's formless. I don't even want to give it a gender. It. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, okay. So, so I continue <laughs> if you need to, but I right, just, no, no, that's it. It just flashed in my head and yeah. now I'm probably not going to remember what I was going to say, yeah. but when you were talking about God, do you look at your life back at when you had your, when your wife left and all that, if you hadn't found that desire to go down this spiritual path and you just kept, you know, waking up in the morning, figuring out what to do with your kids, figuring out how to pay off your debt and didn't even open that eye yeah. to look outward. Do you, what is your look on that? Would you have just had yeah. to come back and do with John Latta? part two <laughs> and till you figured that out, that there is, there is no death and there is this. I mean, like, are you asking about karma, let's say, or, oh, or sure. an unlearned lesson? Uh, that's sure. a great question. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that's probably true. Um, I mean, my belief today is that the soul is behind everything. Although I would say behind the soul, God's really behind everything, whatever that is, but the soul is behind everything. And I think the soul would have done whatever it could to drag me down. Me, I'm calling like me, John, the ego, let's say my personality, the human being uh, in such a way to wake me up. Like, I think the awakening was, it was going to happen. It was whether I was going to make it easy or hard. <laughs> right. <laughs> and yeah. so, but to answer your question, and you know, and the other thing is too, Ashley, I've had too many experiences. I've read some interesting books that I, you know, um, people leave when they're ready to leave. And I, you know, it might not look like their lesson's been complete, but who knows what that lesson actually was. 
And so people can leave at a month of age, they can leave at 90 years of age, they can leave in a car crash, they can leave in illness. And um, I, I read too many books and had too many interesting experiences. I, I, so I'm not sure I can answer your question. I actually, um, I think it's possible that something might happen, you know, that might be like, oh, yeah, I got to go back. I might have to go back 10 times to learn that lesson. Right. At the same time, I kind of believe um, when it's time to leave, I think it's faded. I, yeah. I, I could be completely wrong about that, but I think it's when you're done, you're done. Right. You mean faded as far as like before you even got into this body, you knew your death, you knew your exit yep. point. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, um, so I, I, I waver on that. There's, you know, definitely the argument, like I came in to learn this lesson and if I didn't learn it, I'm going to come back at the same time. I think sometimes, you know, what if I learned the lesson completely at age 25? Okay. Right. You can leave now, John. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, gosh, well, okay. Before we continue on, because yeah. there's a lot more to uncover what, how we, just as, as me asking this question, cause I was listening to a lot of this and I never knew I was always curious on to how are you parenting now while you're going through this awakening yeah. process? Um, so that was interesting because, um, I don't know uh, if you had an opportunity to read my book or if you, if how much you know about the story, but uh, two years after I was the single parent, I had a full on Kundalini awakening. I didn't even know what the word meant. Tremendous right. energy coursing through my Amazing. body and incredible visions. And so um, I, I, I think I mostly kept a lot of what I was going through to myself. And I had found just enough of a spiritual community online that I could email people, phone call, you know, what the hell is this? What am I going through now? You know, <laughs> and, and people would recommend books and they, you know, the books would some often give me comfort, like, oh, okay, I get this. Other people have gone through this. And some people would even call this desirable. So um, I kind of just kind of kept the spiritual journey to myself and a small group of other people. Um, but I, you know, life is so funny, even with all the struggles with my company, because it wasn't the kind of thing that going to work earlier and working harder and working longer hours was going to fix. I actually had quite a bit of flexibility to be a single parent. I mean, I had probably the dream job that every single parent wishes they had where get up, feed the kids, you know, their breakfast, get them on the school bus, go into work. And they'd get off the school bus. Our, our house was the last one. The kids got dropped off. And so they'd get dropped off at 4 p.m. So I'd have roughly eight to four. And, um, and if something came up in the middle of the day or when my kids was sick or something like that, I had the kind of job that I could drop what I'm doing, go home and take care of it and maybe catch up on some things at night after they went to bed. So um, the money part was stressful as hell, but I, worrying wasn't going to fix the problem. Right. And so what really happened was for the next two years, I just took it one minute, one hour, one day at a time. And there was a lot, I was learning lessons about surrender without even knowing, like, excuse my French, Ashley's like, fuck it. If I meant to go under, I guess I meant to go under. It would <laughs> suck. And I hope it doesn't happen. Right. But, you know, I, 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 I had my product in all in stores in all 50 States and there was nothing I could do except pull back the growth ride out that period of, you know, stop the hemorrhaging. And, um, and, and I just had the kind of business that it might take six months to stop the hemorrhaging. You just, I couldn't turn it off instantly. And so um, weirdly, it wasn't like I wasn't working hard or still trying, but weirdly, it seemed like the more I relaxed and let go, the better things got. Yeah. So that was a huge part of my journey. It's like, when is it time to be full of a strong will and to make things happen? And when is it time to just, I've done the best I can. I'm just going to let go and see where it goes now. Right. Wasn't there a time where you were putting your son to bed? Yeah. And you realized how the being in the now moment that struck a yes. chord with me. Yeah. So that's a, and thank you for bringing that. That's a perfect example of John discovering a feminine aspect. He didn't know even existed. So I had started group therapy and all the women were getting on me all the time. John, you're so good at doing, you should just try being I'm like being, what the hell is that? Besides I'm busy. I don't have time to be. And uh, anyway, but they kept getting on me about that. And so I, I'm 
very good at um, staying on task, getting things done. So predictably, I'm like military guy, you know, tucking my kids in bed, tuck my daughter in, kiss her goodnight, turn off the light, go to my son. Oh, he's happily babbling away about his day. And he's really excitedly talking. I wanted to be quiet so I can turn off the light because I've got things to do, right? But then I was sitting there going, yeah, all these women are telling me to just be, maybe I'll try just being, you know, I don't even know what that is. So I just sat there really still. And I probably truly listened to my son for the first time in my life. And all of a sudden I was overwhelmed by love I'd never felt in my life. Like, I'm just going to call it the love, L, love with a capital L. Where it came from, I don't know, but it was overwhelming. I can, I can feel it to this day. That was 20 years ago. I can feel it today. I still have this profound connection with my son because of that experience. And I remember going back to group therapy with all the women, very humble and going, wow, maybe they know something I don't. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, funny. Oh, Yeah. yeah. You know, when, you know, where we're at in our life at this 2022 heading into 2023 in a month, um, you know, I look at life really, it's kind of been a fast forward. I always look at myself as growing, but fast forward the last like two or three years Mm -hmm. of growth. Like I am diving. I know there's more podcasts and people are emerging that, and I have a podcast. So I'm, you know, finding people that really resonate with me. And I'm just like looking at life. I look at it. I look at it like a so much differently than I did even just uh, six months ago. Yeah. It's that rapid. Right. Yeah. So when I look at the way you, so you raised your children and this, you were just on a mission, the Kundalini experience and that in Philadelphia at the QVC (laughs) thing, like that alone. So this is where I was at that stage of your story. Yeah. Why doesn't that happen to me? (laughs) <laughs> uh, I don't know, Ashley, that is, probably, I want that feeling. That's what everybody says. It's like, how can I get some of that Kundalini? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, so a part of me says, I wasn't doing anything. I didn't even know what the word meant. I wasn't practicing Kundalini yoga. I'd never even heard of it at the time. Um, but you know, when I look back, I was doing something. I just, and I, whether it contributed to it, I don't know. But when I went to that first spiritual retreat, uh, he had us practicing heart-centered meditation. That's all he practiced. And over and over again, he says, you know, the heart center is unique. It unifies all the chakras. It unifies the upper chakras we call heaven and the lower chakras that we call earth. It unifies the mind and the body, the soul and the spirit, the masculine and feminine. It's the seed of wholeness. And he just over and over again, encourage people to stay with the heart center, stay with the heart center. And, um, and so, and I, and I was my first introduction to shadow work and his, way of teaching was integrate, 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 integrate. And I really trusted him at the time. And a lot of difficult dreams were coming through. And it was like, yeah, that's a part of me too. Yeah, I could see that side of me too. But not from a a mind way, but from a from a you know a heart centered, like if you were stepping back in unconditional love, yeah, it's all me. And it's they're all awesome. Mm -hmm. And um and so it would be my experience frequently to be meditating and see things visually fly into my heart center (laughs) i remember the first time i was like i saw my ex-wife and i was like oh my god you know she flew right into my heart center no no not her (laughs) (laughs) no but and so i think i had done a lot of work around integration and fears and whether that contributed to it i don't know but coming back to that dream, or I talked about death, where I'm out in that farmer's field at midnight, and there's that big moon on the horizon, and it's cold outside, and there's this big forbidding figure, the scarecrow. I think there's something to moving past your fears, integrating your fears, embracing your fears. And, and then maybe um, that's a step or that's a staging, and then maybe something else happens. Now, having said that, I have talked to some very interesting people. I've actually consulted with people about Kundalini. The experts say the goal of all Kundalini awakening is union with the divine. That's the ultimate goal. And it can take years or decades. Uh, But the interesting thing is my Kundalini was so over the top and it was so classically Kundalini. It was all feminine energy. It was earth energy. It was sexual energy. It was primal energy. I had the best sex of my life night after night with the most amazing goddesses. You so know, funny. I mean, it was really fun. I got to say, and this <laughs> incredible energy. It was just like, oh my God. 
But I had somebody tell me who was a woman, she goes, I had the complete opposite experience. My Kundalini was about integrating the masculine. And she goes, Kundalini energy in her experience, and she'd written some books on the subject, is what she calls completing energy. And so I I think it's entirely possible that mine was very extreme because I'd lived so one-sided and maybe other people that have lived a more balanced, kind of a nice balance between masculine and feminine, maybe didn't have a lot of things that they um, resisted or that triggered them or caused them fear and anxiety. You know, it's, it, they maybe don't need it. I, right. I don't know how to put it. And there's some wonderful teachers that have said almost inevitably along the way, you will encounter some energy but for some reason, it's just really intense and over the top for some people. And others, it's just kind of mild, a little here, a little there. Can you tap into that now at all? Have you done that ever since you left that hotel? <laughs> well, um, it is, unfortunately, I, I've read a lot of stories about that. Um, as the energy progresses, it moves into greater and greater subtlety, which you know is beautiful in a way. And it has taken me into greater and greater subtlety. Uh, it's literally like going from heavy metal music to the <laughs> most subtle symphony. I mean, that's yeah. really the only thing I can tell you that I feel regularly, and other people have said this too, is that um, when something rings true or something feels like pay attention or, you know, there's, you know, that somebody says something and there's that seed of truth, I, I will get, you know, you've probably heard this term, I'll get hits, I would call it, in my perineum area, you know, my root chakra. Right. And um, that's the closest I can come to huh. today, still having that energy. But I, I think if you read books, you'll find it's really intense and gradually starts to fade. And, and oh, actually okay. is a little sadness around that. It's almost like giving up the good drugs, you know? Right. Oh, I bet. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I can only imagine, but yeah, yeah, the way you described it, I'm like, whoa. Okay. Yeah. This is where I want to go now. I want to okay. go to the Doubletree Hotel yeah. south of Bellevue with yeah. the man that's from Orcas Island. Cause my yep. dad used to live in Orcas Island. So oh, I've spent cool. a lot of time there, Yeah, but I want to go through that Mary Magdalene, um, exercise that he had you go through, you know, oh, I, I also, I just want to tell you, I know yeah. you, I mean, you you're an author, so you're a phenomenal writer. And when you, your writing is just, I could read it all day long. It's so, uh, fluent. And I don't, I mean, I just, it's beautiful. Oh my so God. When I was, Thank you so much, Ashley. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. But it's true. I, I mean, just, I was reading that story on your website on, under the blogs. I was reading all your blogs and it was so, I was already in the hotel. I had yeah. sat in the chair and I had experienced like the way you described this experience. And I mean, I, that's why I thought, oh, what a story to share because to go back into those experiences in your life, I'm not going to, I want you to tell it, but you really yeah. do give, give the, the reader like, I'm in there. <laughs> oh my God. And I, I'm so grateful you said that because that was very intentional. Instead of writing it like a memoir, even though it was the last 20 years of my life, instead of writing it from the point of view of today, looking backwards, I tried to immerse myself and the reader in it exactly as I was experiencing it. So even though the stories are all older, older, I tried to write it as I was living it because there's a there's a term that people use for, um, oh, books, you know, they say books carry an energy. And so the term is induction. If a person really gets sucked into the story, they can sometimes take on the story as their own and the energy from mm. it. And so I was intent, you know, I went back and forth with my editor about this because I'm not sure the editor really understood what I was trying to accomplish. And I, I wanted a story because those are my favorite kind of stories where somebody writes like that. And I'm so immersed in the experience. It feels like mine. Yeah. Well, oh, you did. You oh, did thank it. Thank you so much. That was your intention. Check the box. It <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's the story. Um, I had just started dating. So I remember I had gotten divorced right. um, from my ex-wife and I had just started dating and, um, and I'd been going out with this gal named Shauna um, for a short time. And she said, hey, Tom Kenyon's doing this um, class called Sacred Relationship. Would you go with me? And I'm like, eh, I don't want to go to a relationship class, but oh, well, you know, it's our new relationship. I'll say yes. And so oh, <laughs> I literally thought it was going to be 10 people sitting in a circle talking about their relationship. I get there. There's almost 500 people at the Doubletree wow. Hotel. <laughs> and I'm, I, I knew Tom Kenyon did sound healing, other than nothing. I had no idea he had a worldwide following. And anyway, um, 
so the whole class is on sacred relationship and it's actually being inspired and led by Mary Magdalene through Tom Kenyon. And um, the first day and a half was to me felt like relationship 101. I'm not sure I really gleaned anything new, but then he just as casually as can be says, okay, the Magdalene is here now. She wants to do a healing piece. I want you all to close your eyes. And as she sings through me, um, I want you to keep your uh, attention in your heart center. And if you see anything visually, I want you to just keep walking. Yeah. Like don't get hung up on whatever you see, you know, imagine just right. it passing by. And so I, I, I didn't really know what to expect. This is kind of early in my journey. And I closed my eyes and, and I'm, the first thing I notice is I'm sitting under bright lights. <laughs> I can't, so it doesn't feel like I can see within because it feels like the light is shining through my eyelids and I'm uncomfortable and I'm squirming and I'm, uh, nothing's going to happen. And he does his unusual toning and about five minutes into it. Oh my God, all of a sudden, what feels like a blast furnace of energy from the earth with, with a diameter of like three feet comes blasting upwards through my chair into my body. And all of a sudden I'm seeing every single wounding experience of my entire life in perfect chronological order, literally starting with when I was a baby, little things like I remember my parents decided I was too old to have a baby blanket. And so they ditched it. And I was crying about that. I remember having a nightmare, you know, with my, you know, I was three or four years old. I still remember the nightmare. Um, uh, I, I was, a bedwetter. It turned out I had an issue that needed to be fixed surgically. And my parents got mad at me and made me stay home on Halloween. And I still could see the, that my little face looking through the window and watching all the other kids are trick or treating, but I couldn't go because I'd wet the bed. And it was just little things, big things. And I saw each one like a three second movie. <sighs> and, and I did exactly what he said. I just kept walking. I'm just, it's like a, it's like a life review of everything that ever I, I'm going to call wounding experiences, little ones mm -hmm. and big ones, even ones I don't think I even knew affected me, you know, right. and um, halfway into it, which is about 10 minutes, by the way, I'm shaking and sweating. I'm quaking and sweating. Wow. This voice says to me, do you want to keep going? <laughs> and, and I don't say it, but another voice says, yeah, I'm tough. Let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. And it goes on for another 10 minutes. And it's, it took 20 full minutes. I saw every single wounding experience of my entire life. I kept walking and I, I feel both graced and devastated at the same time. I'm, I've been sweating. I've been shaking. Like I just want to go take a shower and take a nap afterwards. And <clears throat> I have thought about that experience many, many, many times. And, and my wife and I now have even talked about that. It's sort of like, um, I want to say in some way, I've moved on from all of those experiences. Like, um, you know, uh, I, I, I want to say everything that's happened in my past, I've let everybody off the hook. I've seen them. Yeah, it sucked, you know, but I'm okay with it now. It, it's hard to put into words, but I want to say in some way, the result of all that was I have enormous peace with my past now. Hmm. Great. I love that. Yeah. And that, I mean, I think that's uh, something we all strive for, Try, yeah. you know, like that's, I mean, I think, you know, relationships too, like what they show you, you know, being now you're married for the second time, you know, yeah. I'm sure this relationship is so different than your first one. Yeah. I've had a lot of practice being married. I'm on my fourth one now. Oh, actually, on your fourth. So. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. But my marriage right now is rock star solid. It's beautiful. And it's amazing. And I think it's just been part of my journey as I learned through relationships. And uh, I think the average therapist would probably say, you know, oh, come on, are you still marrying the same kind of woman? But no, every single wife and relationship I've had has been profoundly different from the last one. Huh. And um, so that's just part of my journey. I just learned through relationships. Huh. And, oh, um, I did, that's cool. I know. Yeah. I, yeah. Every relationship is it's the biggest lesson I think yeah. that you can have. Right. I totally agree. So let's talk about dreams because okay. we're coming to the end. I mean, I'm not kidding you. I was sitting here going, Oh, we'll probably talk about, you know, his awakening, but I'm like, shoot, we're getting to the end. Let's get busy because <laughs> dreams right. is a big part of you. Dreams right. is something that I want you to share because you know, we all have dreams. We remember them. Some of them are mm -hmm. made an impact. Some of them we can look back to some of them. We forget if we don't write them down, <laughs> but all your dreams, you are such a dream dream yeah. person. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I say I'm a dream factory. And sometimes I have to learn to shut it off. Like tonight, I just want to sleep, you know. Um, so a little background. When I went to that first retreat, uh, the teacher really believed in dreams and believed that dreams were sacred. And his teacher said the dreams were sacred. And he gave us an exercise to remember a dream. And prior to that time, other than having a few bad dreams when I was probably in junior high or high school, I couldn't tell you that I remembered any of my dreams. And, uh, and the exercise was, is you get in bed and you're starting to get sleepy and you feel sort of start, starting to drift off to sleep. Imagine in your mind's eye that you walk up to the edge of a cliff, take all of your clothes off, stand with your back to the abyss, and then fall backwards into the abyss in total trust and ask for a dream. And so I started doing that night after night. And maybe the third night I had a dream where I remembered like three seconds of the dream and, you know. Um, and then I don't know how long it was, a couple of weeks, a month, suddenly I'm having three to five dreams a night and I'm writing them down and he had just formed a dream for him. And I started sharing the dreams there and I could not freaking believe how he was seeing in the dreams. The dreams just seemed like gibberish to me. They didn't make any sense. And so there can be, and it definitely was for me, a learning curve in certain in terms of learning the language of my dreams. Um, because People's dream languages, uh, there's individual symbolism, there's also collective symbolism, tribal symbolism, and it's hard to discern. But then, as I got further into it, um, there are so many different kinds of dreams. I would say to this day, still probably 80% of my dreams are just your typical dream. I want to say your mind may be making sense of the day or you know what's going on. But the other 20% are the ones that are profound, you know, where guides and beings show up to speak to you. There's voices, um, dreams of guidance, dreams of warnings, dreams, profound healing dreams too. And so one of the later chapters of my book I wrote was called The Spectrum of Dreams. And I think I identified like 15 different kinds of dreams. Uh, there have been, um, you know, premonitory dreams, you know, where I see the future and I still can't wrap my puny mind around how that's possible. <laughs> right. And so, yeah, dreaming has been a huge part of my life and is probably 50% of the book is related directly or indirectly to dreams. But tell me, give me a, like, a, what is a one dream that comes to your mind? Like what would be like, oh, Ashley, this was like one of the most profound dreams I've ever had. <clears throat> uh, God know where to begin. Um, so I'll give you a, a more of a practical one, but where the kind of kind of would demonstrate how I, I had to learn. So I had, um, when I had my kids and I was single, I had had six straight years of chronic neck pain. And I had been uh, rear ended in a car crash. And I thought I just had classic whiplash type, you know, neck pain, man, I tried everything I went to physical therapy, massage, acupuncture, chiropractic, everything. I even went so far as to have surgery where they put uh, cortisone uh, steroids in the facet joints of my neck. And when I woke up, my neck still hurt. I couldn't believe it. And I was athletic and active. And I just, I can't believe it. I have to live this way the rest of my life. One day I come home from work in tears because at most days I couldn't get past noon before my neck hurt so fiercely. And I lay down kind of a fetal position on my side. And I said, why the fuck does my neck hurt so bad? And that precise moment, this in your face kind of a dream shows up. And it's a monk in red robe with a shaved head walking back and forth out in front at the end of my driveway in front of the house. And so I knew that dream was trying to tell me something, but I couldn't figure it out. And so I went back to that dream form, posted the dream, told about my neck pain. And the teacher said, that dream has everything to do with your neck pain. I was like, I don't get it. And he goes, I want you, you know, why, why do monks shave their head? Why do monks wear red robes? What does a monk symbolize? What does red symbolize? What does a shaved head symbolize? Why is that monk outside of your house instead of say in your house? Why is he patiently, you know, pacing back and forth, you know? And he goes, he eventually said, I want you to see John, you know, again, this is the early days for me. You have a very spiritual side, a selfless servant side, a monk, you know, very devoted to spiritual truth and teachings. I want you to just open to that as a possibility. Okay. Like a month or two goes by, then comes neck dream number two. And here comes that same teacher, Brew Joy, in the dream with his hands out like this. And he's going to heal my neck pain. You know, energy is going to pass through his hands. So I'm like, oh my God, thank you, finally. And as he reaches for my neck, an old man who lives in my neck said, get the fuck away. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, and so again, I, I'm so new. And he just, again, he came back on. He goes, I want you to see, John, 
almost everybody carries resistance in some part of their body. It can be their head, the neck, the shoulders, the back, the belly. You carry enormous resistance in your neck. And I want you to, again, just open to this possibility that you have a very spiritual side and let go of the damn resistance, you know, but I had to get past that old man who lives in my neck, you know, metaphorically. Right. And two years went by of me meditating, opening, meditating, opening. And then came the final culminating dream where I'm in the dream. I'm holding this giant cold and thumbtack in my office, in my house. And I reached over to push it into the bulletin board behind me. And it feels weird. And there's a monk there, an Asian monk with shaved head and red robe. And he's smiling at me with such love. And I've just pierced his heart, but he's just hmm. smiling at me with immense unconditional love. And I realized in that moment, my neck didn't hurt anymore. It just didn't. And, and so to this day, it's something I just have to be conscious of that uh, when I carry resistance, not to let it pile up in my neck. And so that's an example of how dreams healed what I thought was something, a chronic physical ailment for the rest of my life. No, you just carry a lot of resistance in your neck and you're going through a lot of, you're going through a really difficult time and it was all accumulating there. Right. You know, another story before we end, gosh, yeah. see, I could keep going. Yeah. Um, last time is when you were uh, flying at the airport yeah. and you had uh, don't worry, be happy song yeah. and your back was hurting. We got, we used to say that and then we'll close yeah. it up with your book. Yeah. So um, real quickly, and that's a great example. Um, um, I had, I had, you know, I own my own company and frequently had to fly to call on major retailers across the U S and I was flying from Seattle to Jacksonville, Florida with a connection in Dallas. Uh, and the day before I threw my back out and I was just sure, Oh my God, this is going to be terrible sitting in an uncomfortable airplane seat, you know, all the way to Jacksonville. And then I had to fly all the way back the next day. This is going to be terrible. Get up the next day. My back's horrible. I mean, it really hurts. I had to like lift my legs out of the car when I got to the airport I'm standing in line about to head in the TSA agent, my boarding pass and driver's license. And I'm just stealing myself for what I think is going to be a horrible trip. And all of a sudden in the back of my mind, there's a, <laughs> somebody's humming the song, don't worry, be happy and aiming it, the vibrations of the song at my lower back. And I, I stopped and paused and I knew, you know, vibration and sound could be healing to injuries. And I, I knew what was going on there. And so I hand the guy my boarding pass and driver's license and I, I started humming the song. And in the nice thing about airports and airplanes, there's so much ambient noise that nobody notices that you're humming. And so I hummed that song all the way to Dallas, even though I was pinned next to the window by the most impossibly large person in the middle seat. And by the time I got there, the pain had actually dropped a little. And then another impossibly large person sits next to me and I'm pinned next to the window. And again, some voice in me is just sure it's going to be horrible because I'm sitting in this crooked pretzel position with an ouchy back. And now I, I hummed the chorus to Don't Worry, Be Happy hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times. Wow. And it was almost like a mantra. And, and anyway, I did it all the way home the next day. Uh, the last flight, the last leg was from Dallas to Seattle. And I thought I had an empty seat next to me. And instead I had a woman <laughs> with a two-year-old who was kicking me the whole time I hummed. And if my pain on a scale of one to 10 was a six to begin, it was a one at the end of the trip. Wow. And so that's another thing that just came out of nowhere. And it reminds me over and over again, just because it's been that way in the past, doesn't mean it'll be that way again in the future. Right. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So in closing, yeah. in 2020, you wrote a book, you right. were, you know, we were locked down and you had this great idea to use your time wisely and write a book. Right. So you t t tell us about your book. And so the book is called The Synchronicity of Love, Stories That Heal, Transform and Awaken. Um, it's 119 short stories, um, true stories, mostly true stories. Um, and last 20 years of my life and uh, I chose the title, The Synchronicity of Love, because that was the most staggering thing to me is the more I spent time in the heart center and what felt like unconditional love and compassion, the more and more synchronicity started to happen. Um, you know, those sort of unexplained, mathematically improbable coincidences started to happen over and over and over again. And that was enthralling to me because I have a very highly honed mind towards probabilities, having been a businessman and even somebody who spent a lot of time gambling at the racetrack when he was young. <laughs> and so it was kind of amazing to see these things happening. 
that seemed uh, beyond all statistical probability happening over and over and over again. Right. And, you know, I love synchronicities and um, I've had so many magical, I mean, I always call them magical moments, Yeah. but you know, when people realize that they're happening all the time, I mean, I, I probably as intentional as I am coming from love and being open and aware and aligned and in high vibration and looking up and, you know, asking for signs, you know, I, if I see, if I see three, I probably missed 40, you know, yeah. like, but you know, for the most part, it's, it's a constant thing that we yeah. as humans aren't, if we don't, you know, open our eyes to that magic, they just pass us by, or we aren't intentional and choose the signs to look for. But yeah. with, when you come from this love energy, and that's what you talk a lot about that, you know, and we realize that love, compassion, non-judgment, you know, living in this place of just pure, you know, like in this high, I, I guess I could explain it just in yeah. bliss, you know, that's where the magic in my mind resides. Yeah, I agree. I, I um, yeah, I think you nailed it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the funny, you know, I've been on some other podcasts and I remember one guy who's kind of this aggressive dude and he's like, oh, come on, John, you wrote a book about love. When I think about love, I think about, you know, going out to the bar and get some girl to go home with me, you know, talk to me about love. But, you know, love to me, you know, it is the feeling you described, but there's a practical aspect to love because love to me, looking back now after 20 years, <laughs> It's really about moving into wholeness. It's about saying yes, yes, yes to more and more things. And so it's a crazy thing. Yes, it's a beautiful, blissful feeling. And there's all these synchronicities. But I find that I'm more um, resourceful in situations because I'm not so one-sided anymore. So there's a practical aspect to love too. Right. It's like that. personal growth with feeling. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So true. All right. Wrapping it up, John. I, uh, so to find your book, the synchronicity of love yeah. every, on Amazon, on your website and your website is. Yeah. It's John David And my last name is spelled L A T T A. So John David Yes. And great website. I loved reading um, everything. Oh, thank you, Ashley. It was so fun to get to know you and go down your little, uh, your journey and learned. I learned a lot. I learned so, so much about what I you know, look, it made me reflect on my life. And I think when you learn, when I learned from you, what you learned and you and you can reflect and realize maybe I didn't give myself credit for learning, <laughs> you know, like, gosh, <laughs> I really did learn from that. You know, yeah. it's like, a, yeah. you open, you know, it's like when people live, I don't know if the word blindly, or they don't have a, a rock bottom moment in their life, or they don't yeah. have this, like, um, the dark night of the soul, you know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Right. And they live like, you know, this easy, you know, kind of like life and drift. They float, I guess yeah. they, I could call them floaters. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, I don't mean we have to hit a rock bottom moment in our life to be able to crawl up and see the light. But when you listen to a story like yours and you realize, even if you are a floater, you know, it, you don't need to have the rock bottom moment yeah. to expand your life and live into this moment of pure love and bliss. I totally agree. And at the same time, I, I, I actually do not believe the rock bottom, the pain and the hell are necessary. That having been said, it does seem to be how it is for most people. Right. That's when the deepest transformation comes. I, I love you here, Eckhart Tolle, you know, he has a cute little impish smile and he'll mm -hmm. say over and over again, oh, you're not enlightened yet? You just haven't suffered enough. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, you're not, totally. <laughs> but, you know, that was his journey, too. I mean, it was right. horrific suffering for him. And so I, I tell people all the time, uh, I think it's very transformative for people or potentially going through hell. But I don't believe it's necessary. And um, I, I find by staying in alignment with my dreams... And going even further, what I, I would tell almost everybody is um, ask sincerely to stay in full alignment with your soul. And whether you want to call that God or your divinity, as long as you stay close to that, um, 
I'm not sure the suffering is really necessary because I think the suffering is always trying to bring us back to that. Right. For sure. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. What, when people come have their sessions with you, mm -hmm. what are they coming for? What are you d doing with them? <laughs> uh, honestly, um, it's all over the map. And if I were to really tell you what I think is really going on, I think I just hold space for them. Hmm. I, I, I find when I'm working with people, I mostly ask them lots of questions and it's mostly my intuition at work. I'm just asking them questions. And as I ask them questions, I had somebody uh, really cool. They said, oh yeah, that's called the art of drawing forth. And so I think I help them draw forth their own wisdom in a situation. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, and I love yeah. doing that with my, I mean, I work with kids and parents yeah. and oh, I love, especially kids. I just love to pull that out. Yeah, okay. it's like, they just need to have it pulled out and then they know what to do with it. And so right. I'm not really sure I do. I, I think there's a story in my book that I love. I met a guy, I watched him do that and I'd never really seen that before. I knew there was something going on that I wasn't seeing and I was really intrigued by the guy and I asked him and it was in a business setting. And I said, so what do you do for a living? He goes, I'm a shaman. And he just looked like an old white dude, you know? Oh, funny. <laughs> and, I, and I said, oh, you're a shaman. And it's like, so what do you do? He goes, well, I mostly just hold space. But mm. years went by, I kind of get that. There's something wonderful about just meeting somebody where they're at, holding the space in what, to the degree I can, compassion and unconditional love. And then just, if they're open enough, just let me ask them lots of questions. And then they, they usually are able to ferret out their own answers. Right. What is your vision in your, what do you see in your life? Do you do a vision? Do you just live in the now? Do you? Um... Uh, I live in the limbo in between zone right now. It's not actually very comfortable for me, to be honest. I am very much, I still have that master inside that's very goal oriented, vision oriented. I've seen dreams of what uh, my destiny is and they're beautiful, but I don't know if I just wait for them to get there, but something I have to go make happen. And so the answer is I've written a book and I'm talking about it now. I have three other books I'm working on right now. Um, but I, I'll be really honest with you. There is no clear cut, save the world. Here's my mission. Um, and I'm trying to walk that fine line between making it happen and kind of allowing it to happen. Yeah. I had, a, yeah. I've been having conversations with my close friends about, visions, you know, you yeah. got to have a vision. I'm like, well, when you live in the now, I don't know if I yeah. have a grande, you know, vision of where I'm going to be in a year. And, you know, I think it used to be like, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm all about vision boards with, I make vision boards yeah. with the girls and, you know, yeah. we do all that, have parties and I believe in that, but I also have, you know, um, I guess maybe in the last year realize you could make your vision boards and I get the minds, you know, the science behind that, but also if you live in the now and you are just full of love and have that intention to, you know, just see what happens and live, you know, with that eye of like, what is God going to show me today? Or yeah. what am I going to see today? That's where I just, that's, that's my vision. <laughs> that's I love what I've that. <laughs> my wife and I have talked about that quite a bit. Like I love my visions. I love the visuals. I love all the dreams I have, but I'm, I'm completely aware that at the end of the day, there's still the me, the John that's trying to interpret the visions. And sometimes they're not clear. And, you know, everybody has a different way of moving through the world and moving, uh, you know, that mindfulness being present, being in the moment, it's beautiful. Um, and I don't even know if those people necessarily are getting guidance or, you know what I mean? They're just in the now, they're in the flow. Um, and then other people get guidance, intuition, direction, so many different ways. Visually is just one of them. You know, there are people that are clairaudient. They literally get things that are told to them. <laughs> like right. me, I get songs in my head. Right. Um, there are people that get everything kinesthetically. I, I met a woman yesterday for the first time. She kept showing me her forearm as I was talking. And I'm like, what? And it just looked like a normal <laughs> forearm. And she goes, don't you see those are truth bumps. You're speaking the truth. Oh, so, but that was how she interprets whether somebody's lying or telling the truth to her or not is she gets goosebumps if it's truthful. Right. Right. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I would hate to give up my visions, but I realize there are limitations to visions too. Right. Yeah. It's, it's kind of cool to live in that place of, you know, 
being right here right now. Like I yeah. looked at today as this interview and then I go pick up my girls in a little bit and I look forward to that, you know, and yeah. how much longer do I get to do that? I just, yeah. I love that time. I could talk and yeah. the long drive and we enjoy it. And then what do I get to do? I, I kind of have really programmed my, the way I, out, my outlook on my day yeah. in that way, like they are little segments, but it's like, I'm fully into it. Like I'm, I'm like, I was, I'm so into you right now. By the time we turn it off, it's like, okay, then what, you know, it's, it's just, you know, being present, you know, it's beautiful. I think it's part of what I'm, I'm going to compliment you. It makes you a really good podcast host. It's like, I can sense the preparation. And I also fence sense as you're going through it, you're just taking it second by second, moment by moment. Oh, and, thank uh, you. Yeah. I, I I've done about 30 of these now in the last six months. So I'm like, oh, Ashley's got it going, going on, you know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, the ones that are really prepared, but at the same time, let it all go and just kind of let it flow. They do a really good job and you're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. Yeah. On that note. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> I had to get that in before the end. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, so nice to meet you. Now I have another friend in Washington. Oh, great. 